We are starting a new series this week, and the title for this morning is Who Am I? This entire series is, I don't know, it started in the, in the other series, where David said, the Lord is shepherding me. The Lord Yahweh, God of all creation, has come down and is shepherding me. And so this morning, as we begin, I want to ask the question, who am I? Our text will be in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 28, but it's going to be just a little bit. If you could come up in a few words, and I, I would like you to, this is responsive, what it means to be a Christian what it means to be a follower of God. What would you answer? And please give me some answers. Peace. Spirit of love. Spirit of love. What else? Transformed. Being transformed. I'm actually reading a book that's titled that. Be ye transformed. <laughs> In the middle of it. Well, no, I'm a third of the way through. Child of God. And a couple more. Servant. Servant. One more. Give me one more. Be willing. Be willing. That's good too. We are, it's going to probably take three weeks. It took Jesus three sentences to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not Jesus, so I'm a lot more wordy. All right? Just forgive me, but that's just who I am. We are going to answer the questions of what it means to be a Christian, what God expects of us, who God is, who I believe that I am, and what God expects of me. Now, I know that is a rather substantial task, and that's the reason it's probably going to take us three weeks, but it may take more, it may take less. Jesus gives us the answer to these questions. Who he is, who I am, who I believe I am, and what he expects of me in the three sentences that we're about to read. He answers it when a master of the law questions him about a law. Let's read it. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came. The scribes were, they, they're literally all of their life. They wrote down the Bible, and they were ancient copies. They were the copiers of that day, okay? You just, you just kept filling them with ink. Anyways, then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, perceiving that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That Lord, notice it's capital L-O-R-D, it's the same Lord that David mentioned in Psalm 23 that was shepherding him. The Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's a statement, by the way. To do those two things is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared ask him a question. Jesus here gives us the answer of who God is. He gives us the answer of who we are. He gives us the answer of what he expects of us. 
So let's go through it. From Jesus' answer, who is God? Jesus says here, the Lord, like we talked about a few weeks ago, and I'm not going to go back over, I'm not going to rehash that, but the Lord creator, Yahweh, the unpronounceable name of God, he is the God of all, and he is one. He is also our personal God. Now, this is important because this is Jesus speaking. Was Jesus God? Yes. He's also speaking about God. Uh-oh. Now, how can there be two when there's supposed to only be one? And Jesus quotes that there's only one. He answers that the Lord is one. But he also gives us the answer that we are one as well. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In the Hebrew, if you wanted to emphasize something, you would say it twice. If you wanted to give it the most power you could, you would say it three times. In the Hebrew, three is plural. We think of two being plural. But in the Hebrew, it takes three. And so when you would say something and you wanted to say it as loud and so that everybody would get it, you'd say it three times. Zig Ziglar said that repetition is the mother of all learning, the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. Teachers do the same thing, don't they? They repeat the same information over and over again. I had a teacher that he would give it to you two or three times, and then he would say, a word to the wise is sufficient. And if he said that, you knew it was going to be later up on the test. <laughs> you knew you had to underline that in your notes to take the test. Teachers do the same thing. It's repetition. God here, notice I underlined it and I emboldened the words three times. It says two different things. In the New Testament, Jesus would say, Verily, verily, I say to you. Anytime you see that in the King James or the New King James, or truly, truly, I say to you, <laughs> Jesus could not say anything stronger to those that were listening. And you could be assured, just like a teacher was, if he said, verily, verily, I say to you, whatever came afterwards is going to be on the final test, and you'd better know what it is. Okay? Jesus did the same thing. And so here... In Genesis, all the way back at the beginning, talking about our creation, it gives us some more information. First of all, it says, let us. That is plural. That's not two. That's three. It says, let us make man in our image. But then notice, it says, let us make man in our image. Then you go down to verse 27. So God created him in his own image, in the image of God who created him. <laughs> Three times Genesis tells us specifically that we were created in the image of God. If God is one and we are created in his image, we also are one. Each of us is an individual person. We have a whole. But we are also a plural. But there's something else that you can take from this passage. Notice, for any of you scientists out there, it says, let us make man. So, verse 26, who wanted to make man? God. Verse 27, so God created man. And then also... He created male and female. It could not be expressed any more strongly in the passage that God created you and I. And that he created us male and female. 
Couldn't be said any stronger than that right there. Okay? He created us, and he created us in his image to look and to be like him. This is huge. This is important. I'm building a basis here. Now, I will say, by the way, this is also the introduction, so I'm going to give you terms, and then when we get deeper into them, we're going to expand on them as we go down the sermons. But my point is, God's, Jesus said, the Lord is one. We are one, individuals. But we are created in his image. There is, in verse 26, in the creation, a plural. Because we know that God is three persons in one. Father, Son, and Spirit. We also, because we were created like him, have those same qualities. Let's continue. Jesus mentions it here. First of all, we are one, verse 29, right? Lord God is one, we're like him, so we're one. But then in verse 30, Jesus mentions this. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There are parts to this, and we'll talk about the strength that's technically, it's not a verb, it's an adverb, but we will, we'll, or an adjective, excuse me. We'll talk about that when we get there. But the point is, there's three different parts. There's a heart, there's a soul, and there's a mind. We are all together one, but we are separate. I will better define these terms as we go through, but I would like to mention this as well. When you start studying into these parts of the human body and soul and spirit, people go nuts. <laughs> because the definitions are all over the place. It's very difficult to get a straight answer when you're studying it. I've spent hours, actually I've spent a couple weeks, <laughs> hours in those weeks trying to study this. Because it's very difficult. And part of the problem is the Bible often uses the same word interchangeably. You can find places where the soul and the spirit are very close, almost inseparable. And I said almost because the scripture actually gives you the definition to split them. But we'll get that when we get there. My point, though, is as you talk about the body, there's some overlap with the soul. And as you talk about your soul, there's some overlap with the spirit. But they are distinctly different. But God gave, us, gave them to, him, to us in such a way that we can see they're inseparable. All right? All of us have a body. That's what everybody sees. That's what everybody uses. That's your five senses. It has your drives. It has your desires. We all want to eat. The longer I preach, the longer you want to sleep, right? We all have our desires. Our body, when we die, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, goes back to the dust where God created it. That's the outside. That's the shell of us. But on the inside of us, there is something that God gave us specifically, being his image, that nothing else in creation has, and it is his spirit. And when we die... That spirit goes back to him who created it. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. If Jesus said, this is what it means to be a Christian. If this is the most important thing, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength, we need to know what those mean. And all too often, we take that whole passage, we lump it together because we really don't understand it, and we just say, we got to love God with everything we got, and we move on. And you can do that, but it really detracts from your spiritual life. If this is the most important thing by Jesus' words, we need to figure out what they mean. You can't just lump them together with everything else. Outside of us is our body. Our spirit is the inside of us. Together, they make a living soul. In creation, God created the plants all first. Everything that you see. It has a body. It has a form. It has a shape on the outside. But then 
when he created the animals, it says that he created them with a body as well. They came up from the dust. He created them. But then he also gave them, made them a living soul. Now, often we get this confused because we automatically think soul, we think spirit, that it's something on the inside, and so animals don't fit that mold. That's not correct. In fact, the word that says we are created soul is the same word that says that he gave them life and they, be, they have souls. And we'll get into these definitions more later on in the week. But the thing that we have that nothing else does is we have the breath of God in us. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, which we read. When he breathed into us the breath of life, we became an object that is alive, that is his image. Nothing else in all of creation has this. Now, you, there's lots of different ones. You can talk about an egg, and it has a shell, and it has a yolk, and it has egg white, and you can talk about ice, and uh, you can say one of them's gas, one of them's vapor, one of them's liquid. You can say soup, that it's all together, it's soup, but it's got different ingredients. All of them, they're just images to try and get us to think about these three areas of our life. And they all have their shortcomings. But the point is, each of us have something on the outside. Each of us has something majorly different than all other creation on the inside. And we are alive. As we go through this series, there are three forms. One place that I'm going to take us is the temple. The temple on the outside, you see the big black border of the wall around the temple. That was the outer court. That's what everybody saw. It wasn't anything necessarily spectacular until it got to Herod. And, uh, the original was not all that spectacular, especially the tabernacle. They put badger skins on top of it. It wasn't that great. But then when you moved in, once you got inside that outer court and you came to the holy place, the holy place had started to have the gold. It had showbread and it had the uh, incense burner and it had the uh, lampstand. This is where the priest met with God. It was separate. It was inside. But this is where the priest met with God. But then further than that, even closer, is where God dwelled dwelt dwells i don't know i guess dwells would be correct this was a place that was altogether separate at the time before jesus died only once a year the priest would go in and i'm sure you've heard that little illustration before they tied bells around the guy because if he went in there with sin god had strike him dead the bells would stop ringing and they'd pull him back out <laughs> you didn't go in god's presence with sin that was just not going to happen Here's why it's important. When we look at our lives, we're going to come across these definitions. There's a mind, there's a heart, there's a spirit, there's a body, there's a soul. In this same form, the blue on the outside is what everybody sees. It is our body. The blue and the yellow, the inside of us, is our soul. It's what everybody sees, but it's our living. It's also on the inside. Our spirit is something that's deep within us. It is where God dwells, where God lives, where God speaks, where God empowers. Out from that is our heart. Our heart is what receives our passions, our drives. It's what changes our mind and our focus. So let's go to the passage yet again. Verse 30 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. When we think of what it takes to be a Christian, we often think of all of the sacrifices that we are supposed to make. That if we, if we become the God, we got to stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this. And all the time the devil's telling you, if you go to follow after God, your life's going to be boring. You're going to miss all the fun. This isn't going to be great. The fun that he fails to mention, what it actually you're going to be missing is the depression, the addiction, the loneliness, the heartache, the brokenness, and ultimately the death. He doesn't want to tell you all of the end results. Just get the happiness and the joy and the fun, the fulfillment. Get it now quick and hurry. doesn't matter how you get it. Just do it quick. And it destroys us. We expect that 
God wants for us as Christians to make sacrifices, to work harder, to strive more, to be this, to be that, to look like this, to look like that. But Jesus in his answer said what? I don't want you to make sacrifices every day. That's not the most important thing. I don't want you to make sacrifices once a year. I don't want you to have a mustache. I don't want you to have short hair or long hair. I don't want you to have a beard. Especially you ladies, right? He doesn't say any of that. What does he say? He gives a positive. He says, I want you to love. When we're talking about God, what does that tell us about Him? Well, we know that the Scripture tells us God is love. But He is a God that wants, desires love. He is a relational being that wants to share with you and me. He wants that love. What does that tell you about us? We need that love too. We can't survive in this world without the love of God in us. He is love, and we also need that love. You say, oh, thank goodness. That's easy. I can love God. I love God. I don't know how many times I've heard that as a pastor. And I've had to smirk on the inside, because if I smirked on the outside, they'd probably slap me. Because they say, oh, I love God. And then they come up, and you look at their lives, and you realize, but you're doing thing on a, things on a daily basis that pull you away from Him, that destroy your relationship with Him, and ultimately wound him severely put him on the cross all over again daily that's not love can you imagine me trying to do that with Sonia <laughs> Sonia and I are going to get married and while we're on the while we're getting married I'm going to go off and I'm going to start shaking hands with all the ladies that, that marriage wouldn't last long would it if I decide, all right, now we've been married for a few years, we're together, she's not going to leave me, I'm going to go off and run around. It's not going to work. If I'm going to come home, well, oh, she's not going to leave me, so I'm going to slap around and tell her what I want her to do for me. Well, you don't know my wife. <laughs> it doesn't work. We know that it wouldn't work in a relationship here on earth. Why in heaven's name would we think that it would work in our spiritual walk? And yet people do it all the time. Oh, I love God. And then everything that they do is not loving God at all. You see, the word that Jesus uses here for love is not the frilly, conceptual type of love we think of in our Western world. It's not feelings. It's not hopes and dreams. It's the word agapeo. The word agapeo is a love of sacrifice. It is a love of choice. It is a love that makes the decision even when it's hard. Jesus said it of himself. John chapter 15, I believe it's verse 13. Almost said 31. He said, greater love has no one than this. Than what? Lay down his life. You see, that's agape love. It's laying down your life. God says, what I expect of you is not easy. It's not conceptual. It's not apart from the rest of your being. It's not just in your heart and not in your members. It's all of you. And it is loving supremely. It is being so captivated by God that you are willing to make any sacrifice necessary to follow Him. Ouch. You can't love agape love haphazardly. It takes everything that you have. It makes the choice daily, as we talked about, to put on the new man. To say, I don't feel like it, but God, I'm going to show you I love you today. Here's the problem. 
You see, the human spirit, as I mentioned, and we'll get more into it later on, but the human spirit that we have, we had God's spirit. He breathed into us when we were created, but we all sinned. And when we sinned, we lost his spirit, and we have now our own spirit. Our spirit is lost. Our spirit is the enmity with God. The problem is the spirit is what feeds our life. As you can see the arrow on the left side of that little diagram. From the spirit we get our desires, we get our drives. That's what comes into our heart. That's our emotions. That's how we feel. That's what burns in us. That's what we go for. It doesn't mean that everything we do outside of Christ is immoral. It's just not good and it's not going to save you. I've known some very good and moral people. But you cannot fill the first commandment of the law by just being a good person. Your good isn't good enough. Because what's coming out of your spirit is selfish thoughts and desires. And down there below the selfish thoughts and desires is your mind. You have these drives. You have them on your body. Your bodies have drives. On the inside now, you're being fed through these drives. And when it comes to the open door of what you do, as your mind thinks, so you do. And if everything on the outside is bad, <laughs> desires, selfish desires, if everything on the inside that is feeding your mind is bad and selfish, guess what you're going to do? Everything's coming out selfish. How can you supremely love God, sacrificially love God, lay your life down for God, how can you do any of that if that's the result that you're getting all of the time? It's impossible. It's hopeless. There's no way of fixing that. There's no way of repairing that. What I do, Pastor... Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. All of us have been there. All of us have had our own human spirit and it's just fed evil in our lives. Whether we've tried to do good or whether we have not, it's all come out as filthy rags. Go look up what the filthy rags means and it's really filthy. We cannot fix this problem. We can't repair this problem. There's something on the inside of us that is eternally broken. We have to have something new. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things, and it is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to, the, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. When you look at that little diagram, that centerpiece is your heart, and it is desperately broken, wicked. You can't fix it. You can't trust it. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs and that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him most assuredly. Remember what I said to you early? He doesn't say verily, verily. He says most assuredly here in the New King James, but it's the same meaning. I say to you, this is going to be on the final exam. You better be ready for this. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man who be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Logical answer, he's looking at the outside, the body. And Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, the physical, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So not only does the shell need to be born again, the inside needs to be born again. It doesn't need to get better. It doesn't need to be healed. It doesn't need to be fixed. It can't be. It's got to be completely reborn. 
verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. That's the Spirit. And you hear the sound of it, but it cannot tell from where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Here he comes again. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is going to be on the test. You all are going to stand before God and answer for this question. I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to the heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. You and I have our own spirit that we cannot repair. The only way it can be fixed is if God himself gives us a new spirit, his spirit, and gives us a new heart, his heart, that's soft and pliable. David, in Psalm 51, after his murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, and his adultery with Bathsheba, he wrote back in a psalm, but it was his prayer, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. David said, I got to be cleaned up. I got to have a new spirit. You're the only one that can do it, God. Sonia, if you'll come, Gina. When God created the animals, he created the caterpillar to fly. But try as the caterpillar might. It can't jump, it can't wiggle, it can't stretch enough to be able to get itself off the ground and fly. It takes a transformation. A frog was made to be in the water and out of it, to make it amphibious. But it takes a transformation to do that. You can kill an awful lot of little frog babies by cleaning out an old pool because they haven't been transformed yet. If you don't believe me, ask my kids. It was traumatizing to them. (laughs) You and I were made to spend eternity in heaven, loving God with agape love as saints. But for that to take place, there has to be a transformation. Your good enough isn't good enough because everything that's feeding your heart and your body is evil selfish desires to love God you need to be transformed the only way to be transformed is to be born again I pray that God gives you the spirit would you stand with us hi everyone thank you so much for watching it really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel 
uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.